What's it like to have been such the center of Canadian writing? You know, there were about three or four of you who are really the center of Canadian writing, and now all the younger writers and your plays are done less, and you know, uh, Albert's re remounting them here. But um, what's it like? I mean, I only talk from my own experience, right? As, you, as an actor, you enter, suddenly the career opens up, and you're in the center of the industry, and then as you get older, you feel yourself being drifted or drifting to the edges of the industry. It's scary. Um, I think one of the things, even when I, when, when I had the success with Leaving Home, it was uh, part Part of it is uh, terrifying because um, you've got new responsibilities, and and I, I, I tried to write about um, the, the fear of success in, in jitters. That's one of the fears. Fear of failures in it, but it's also the fear of success. It changes your life completely and gives you new responsibilities and new stress. And everybody's everybody's waiting to uh, <laughs> cut you down. I can I always I always feel that, that, that in this country. Well, it isn't in this. It isn't in this country. It's everywhere. It happens to check off. It happens to everybody. They wait for you. They give you a big success. They build you up, and then they cut you down. Even with even check off. It's it's something endemic in the. Uh, in the creative communities, I think. I think it's, it's just there. And I, I sort of accept it, part of me, but I resent it too. And is it a healthy reflex? I don't know if it's healthy, but it's, it's, it's real. Everybody complains about it. Who's ever had any success? Mm -hmm. They're just waiting to get knocked down. And they usually do. It's a little different in this country too. I mean, if you follow, you know, someone like Pinter, you know, he kind of roars to success with early plays, and then has a kind of medium part to his career, and he continues to write well, and then he's he's off to the side at the end. But that's a different culture in that there's a deeper respect for just writing, and a deeper respect for the place of the artist and the culture. Whereas in our culture, we don't have that yet. We the arts do not sit, you know in the body of Canadian culture, we're on the side. Yeah. We're still the, the kids who put on bits of entertainment on the edges. And it's, um, so criticism cuts deeper in a way, I think, for us. And Hollywood in America is very different because their career tra trajectories are so astronomically high. Yeah, there's no ceiling there. And, but when they fall. Yeah. That, that was one of the things I always noticed when I went, had, had shows in America. They used to look at me. I, I, could, I could feel it too. They used to look at me like, this guy could be the next Tennessee Williams or Arthur Miller. That, that's the way they looked at you. Until they found out that you weren't. They, they, there was always that possibility there. And they treated you very differently. Because in, in America, there is no, no, no ceiling. That's right. And did you like that when they looked at you that way? Yes, I did. Yeah, I did. And is that a, an illusion, a dream, a bubble? Because again, I think of my own career early on. Oh, you should go to Hollywood. Oh, they're looking at this film. Oh, the next young actor. And suddenly, oh my God, you could be that kind of actor. Yeah. And then that kind of expectation yeah. very quickly gets. Yeah. Well, you know. Is that because we don't make dreams here? We don't have myths about ourselves? Well, I'm, I'm trying to create myths about myself. But your myths have about, got about, the feet on the ground, though. Your yeah. myths have... But, uh, um, I, th I always thought I was trying to create a, a, a mythology with, uh, with the Mercer plays. In what way? Well, it's all about, it's all about uh, immigrants in America. It's, it's the one great subject, I think, of the 20th century, I immigration. And I always wanted to create a whole dynasty of... Well, you have. Yeah, I think so. And I'm still trying, I'm still, I'm still working on, uh, on another Mercer play, but I don't know if I'll ever, I'll ever finish it. Number, number, number six? Right. 
but I can never guarantee that I'm going to finish anything until it's finished. And how far along are you? About halfway through it. Were you ever approached, uh, because part of the conversation that I'm wanting, to, that we are having is there's the art of it. You know, what you say you want to communicate, you want to tell stories. And part of it is the career of it. And for the young writers who I hope are watching some of this interview, eventually, that the pull of the art of it and what you want to do as an artist, as a writer, and then the career of it. And how do you manage the careers, the ups and downs, the catastrophes, the praise, and then the executions? The career, I, the, the career, I somehow just, just stumble around. I, I've been, I've managed to have a career for, since '72. Well, since way before that, though, because I wrote for television. I don't know how I do it. I just do it. It just happens. Things just happen. Right. People want to do my plays, and I, my agents gives them permission to do them. That's my career. And do you read extensively? Yeah, I do. Who are your favorite writers? Well, what, what, what kind of writers are we talking about? Let's we'll say playwrights. Well, anybody who's any good. <laughs> Mammoth. Mammoth is a good playwright. What is it you like about Mammoth? I like all the things that uh, we, we, we've been talking about. The fact that he, uh, he believes that plays are uh, all about action and, of course, language. Language and, and action. I actually, I actually think that I learned more uh, about writing uh, plays from studying Hemingway than I ever did from studying any playwright. Because, you know, he, he always talked about those virtues of simplicity and economy and accuracy and, you know, those kind of virtues. Right. And I, I took that from prose into plays. I thought, if that works as as a novelist, that's got to work as a playwright too. And I'm just wondering if, if writing, if other people's writing uh, invigorates you like that or oh, you need that kind of thing. It does. Um, it's, why I, it's why I became a writer in the first place, before I even knew how I became a writer, Bob. Did you ever hear that story? No. Well, again, it's got to do with, with reading. Um, I, I, I was in grade eight at Bronson Public School. I was a class clown, very destructive kid. And um, it was two days before I got out of grade eight. And our, we had a teacher named Mr. Bean. And he said, French, shut up. He said, get up here to the bookcase and, and take a book and sit down and read, and read it. And he said, you're disrupting everybody. So I slouched up to the bookcase, grabbed the first book I saw. I didn't know what it was. I just grabbed the book and um, sat down in my seat. And I opened up the book. It was Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. And I started to read this thing. And before I got halfway through it, not only did I want to be a writer, I knew I was. I knew I was. Because the, wor the words excited you, the yeah, story excited absolutely, you? absolutely. I knew I was a writer. And uh, within, within two months, I was publishing little pieces of poetry and, and short stories in, in the Canadian Boy, the mag little glossy magazine. And so I was 15 years old. So I did that. I, that's my first sale. And um, I, then I wrote my first play when I was 23. And how I wrote that, I had a girlfriend in Montreal. We broke up one night. And I, I was going back to Toronto to, to put my head in the oven. I was going to kill myself. So I got on the bus with my typewriter. And I'm sitting there in a the seat, and the moonlight on the snow. The bus was dark, and I started to get this idea. These two kids, they, they commit suicide. And at the end of the play, they go back towards life. This, is, this, is, this idea was going around in my head. I saw, literally saw, this old shack by a river with uh, smoke curling up around the steps, a mist curling up around the steps. And down the road, the surrealistic road, came this young girl. 
and she interacted with this old guy inside the sh sh shack, and I suddenly realized he's the boatman. I didn't know this. He's the boatman that carries these souls across the river Styx. And a little while later, this down the road comes this young, young guy, and he interacts with her and him. And at the end, they decide to go back towards life. Well, I couldn't wait to get off the bus. I didn't want to kill myself anymore. I wanted to write this play. So I rushed home, and I was living with two actors, the corner of Charles and Young, over a Greek restaurant. It's no longer there. And uh, I sat, that we had no furniture. So I grabbed a pad of paper and a, a pencil, and I sat on the kitchen floor for 18 hours and wrote this play called Beckons the Dark River. I, if I were writing it now, I, did, I would just call it Dark River. But I, I call it Beckons the Dark River. And I, I wrote it in 18 hours, typed it up when I finished, sent it back to the CBC in Montreal. They bought the goddamn thing <laughs> for $400, which was a lot of money in those days right. for me. And that was my first sale, my first play. So you talk about life and death, you talk of action, you talk of blood. And there you've just described to me a situation of your life, of blood, of yeah. life and death, yeah. that you then it pours out in a play. Yeah. But my, all my plays come out of my life. Even when they don't appear to, they do. Some more obviously than others. When you do talk to young writers, because you do workshops and you, do, you go to some writing places, what do you say to young writers? I always ask, uh, ask them, I guess, is why do you want to uh, write plays? And I usually ask them, do you like, what, what plays do you, do you read? And they look at me, um, uh, well, I say, well, just give me two, two plays that you've read. Mm, um, they don't read plays. Right. They don't read plays. They don't go to the theater, and they want to write plays. I said, you realize that you're dealing with one of the most difficult literary and dramatic forms in the world? And you don't, you don't go to the theater, and you don't read plays? How in the hell are you going to write, write plays? I said, writers learn from reading and writing. That's how they learn. Those are the only ways that you can learn. You read plays, and you write plays. And they don't they just they haven't got a clue how, mu how, how much hard work goes into them. And I always try to stress that too. Right. And getting away from the stupid idea of glamour. God, they think this glamorous. I suppose it is if you have a hit play every time you, you go out, but who does? Nobody does. <laughs>